My name is Andy Jones. I'm the CEO of Ramsey here in the UK. Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. We operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff. And incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey Hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide, and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic programme called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this programme and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this programme out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare. The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, hopefully um, you haven't been affected uh, too much by the uh, terrible weather we've been having. Um, my name is Rhys Thomas. Uh, welcome to tonight's uh, lecture of distinction, which is uh, this evening on uh, Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, tonight's speaker is Roop Singh Diop, and thank you to Ramsey Health for sponsoring tonight's lecture. Now, please submit any questions uh, using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Your attendance certificates for CPD will be issued following submission of your feedback. Uh, as usual, you should receive an automated feedback email after logging out from tonight's broadcast. If you don't receive the automated email within the next 24 hours, then please use the previous link and enter the new code shown in the Zoom chat shortly. So I'm very pleased um, to have speaking to us tonight, um, Roop, who is a fellowship trained consultant foot and ankle surgeon in Stevenage and Welling Garden City. Uh, he's a senior surgeon there, having been in post for just over 10 years and has developed the service into a uh, full consultant foot and ankle unit, uh, which now runs its own fellowship uh, training program. Uh, he's also the current chair of the SICOT Foot and Ankle Committee. So uh, I'll pass you over now to Ruth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reese. Um, is that is that uh, projecting? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Great, thank you. Uh, firstly, um, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Rhys, for that introduction uh, and a big thanks to the BOFAS Educational Committee uh, for this invitation to give a talk on Achilles tendinopathy as part of the um, Lectures of Distinction um, series. So 
over the next uh, 35 uh, to 40 minutes, I'm just going to uh, run through uh, a bit about the background of the Achilles uh, and then really focus on the management of the two groups of entities, namely mid-substance uh, and uh, insertion of Achilles tendinopathy, uh, and then go into some case uh, examples that hopefully could generate a, a bit of discussion. So the Achilles is the strongest tendon in the human body, um, and it's very stiff and resilient. Um, it's thought to have evolved around 2000 years ago, uh, allowing us as humans to run faster. And in fact, it can take um, up to 12 times our body weight through it. However, there is a double-edged sword to this, and it's also the most susceptible to injury. And as we know, um, uh, ruptures are not uncommon and greater than 8% strain uh, can lead to a rupture. But Focusing on its anatomy is quite important because it's not just a linear tendon that runs into bone connecting muscle to bone. And it's got some specific characteristics um, that make it unique. Firstly, it originates from three separate muscles, the gastrocnemius, the soleus and the plantaris. And the insertion is also not a single point. Um, it affects and actually affects movements in three separate joints, the ankle, the subtalar uh, and also the knee joint. And lastly, it's not got its own synovial sheath. It's got this very thin um, uh, fibrovascular paratenon sheath. Um, and there are issues with blood supply that we'll come on to in a moment. So at the cellular level, cellular level it's largely uh, tenocytes and tenoblasts. Um, and it's mostly type one collagen packed into these parallel bundles surrounded by an endotenon. And that's macroscopically what you see um, as the Achilles tendon. And it's further then surrounded by an epitenon and then this thin paratenon I've just mentioned. Proximally, so uh, the gastrocnemius, the two heads coming off the distal end of the femur, so uh, proximal to the knee, composed mostly of um, uh, the type two uh, or fast twitch uh, fibers. Uh, whereas uh, distally, um, uh, whereas the soleus is a, a, a thicker, flatter muscle that comes off the back of the tibia, mostly type 1 fibres. And then you've got the plantaris coming up the uh, popliteal surface of the femur that can, can insert anywhere but cause some problems on the medial side uh, of the Achilles um, that we will come on to uh, in a little while. And it's important to, as I mentioned, realize that the fibers aren't vertically aligned. They've got this spiral orientation that can actually um, give a mechanical advantage because you get this concentrated stress area. Gastronemius coming in posterolaterally, soleus uh, posteromedial. And we all think of the wide bony insertion as the Achilles insertion, which is this wide enthesis organ even, that stress dissipates across the bone um, and allows uh, a lot of the movement to occur. But there are other um, insertions. Now, um, in terms of uh, um, the sleeve, we have a sleeve that comes round from the Achilles all the way down to the plantar fascia. And it's felt to be that that is a continuum. Um, and, uh, and essentially, that can, uh, if we look at the way we treat plantar fascial problems and Achilles problems in the first line, they're often quite similar. So that makes sense. The other is the fibrous septi that actually attach to um, the, um, the skin and the fat just in this area here. And if you ever uh, um, are doing something like a subtalar fusion where you insert your, your inserting your screws quite distal, um, that fat can be quite a um, quite something to deal with. And it does have a, adhesions to or sorry, attachments to uh, the Achilles. So you've got this uh, retrocalcaneal bursa that sits just in front um, of the tendon and just behind the um, uh, calcaneal, uh, postero superior calcaneal uh, prominence. Um, I'm in purposefully not using the word hagland, and I, I'll come on to that in, in a moment when we talk about um, uh, nomenclature. So the vascular supply is very important. Proximally and distally, it's got supply from the musculotendinous junction and distally from the bony insertion. But it's the bit in the middle um, that, that concerns us, really. And we've got um, this area from the perineal artery in the, the mid zone um, that is not great blood supply. And that why we're, we're so uh, concerned about a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the surgeries and the actual conditions and uh, just putting the pointer on here and it's that middle ground where most of the ruptures are seen 
um, and most of the problems occur, that area of poor supply. So nomenclature, well, there's a hodgepodge of terms that, that are out there for, um, for this, starting off with inflammatory problems uh, in, the, in the mid 70s, uh, then going div dividing the tendinitis, and it's not a tendinitis, it's a degenerate, not inflammatory uh, condition into insertional and non-insertional. So we're getting that sort of binary break in the, in the early 90s. Uh, and Nick Mafuli, I think, has done a lot of work on this, um, trying to standardise uh, the terminology. Um, and he described a clinical syndrome of pain, swelling and impaired in perfor uh, performance uh, known as tendinopathy. And, and largely that, that term has, has taken over. Um, and further on, uh, as part of the Achilles uh, Tendon Study Group, um, Nick Van Dyke also suggests a very neutral, descriptive, uniform um, approach using uh, anatomical locations, symptoms, findings, uh, and uh, the pathology involved. So what does that mean? Avoid using confusing terms. Uh, I, I'm guilty of it, as, uh, as many are. Uh, Hagland's disease, Hagland's triad, um, we may be meaning something else, but using the same terminology, pump, bump, runner's heel, tendonitis. So try and, and stick to standardized terminology that is very descriptive rather than uh, historic terms. Um, and try not to create any new terms. Um, uh, we sometimes like to do that. So what causes it? Well, ironically, despite it being very common, it's unclear. Um, there are many implicated factors, both intrinsic, starting at the muscle tendon unit um, being dysfunctional, um, we've touched on vascularity, gender, age, um, and there, there is uh, association with, with age, and again I'll come on to that in a little while, um, as well as lateral ankle instability uh, and increased fat. Intrinsic, uh, extrinsically, um, Newer and newer sports, different surfaces, different footwear types and cleat designs. So um, things are changing and all of them could be uh, and possibly are having an impact on, uh, on the Achilles um, and it becoming diseased or tendinopathic. Uh, I'm certainly no expert on uh, genes, but these genes have been associated with uh, Achilles tendinopathy. So it seems to be having a rising incidence um, uh, and, and age is one factor, but recreational sporting activity is felt to be uh, one of the main, um, main causes. Now, there is a slight problem uh, in that the data um, out there in the literature is largely from developed countries and largely urban locations. So, um, for example, whereas in uh, you could be talking about badminton and uh, uh, badminton players having Achilles tendinopathy in Scandinavia, and there may be good literature on that, but other badminton playing nations such as China, far less literature. So um, there, we've got to be a bit careful when, when looking at the literature uh, and thinking we know what, what's actually going on. I think we can say, certainly uh, post-COVID and my attempts to start uh, a bit of uh, exercise, uh, jogging and running uh, has become uh, slightly more popular. Uh, and we can expect a rise in incidence of this already very common uh, condition. Okay, so how do we break it down? Well, the bold headings, non-insertional and insertional. The non-insertional is in the mid portion of the tendon. Um, the, the, um, uh, it, it can either be tendinopathy in the tendon there or in the surrounding paratenon. The insertional type can have um, a problem either at the tendon as it inserts in the bursa just ahead or the superficial calcaneal bursa uh, just to uh, the um, side. So literally the tendon, the bursa or the superficial bursa. So non-insertional mid portion tendinopathies. Again, it's a clinical syndrome, pain swelling and impaired performance. Um, it can be diffuse uh, around the tendon or it can be fairly localized. Uh, sorry, just jumped to... Uh, it can be uh, diffuse, or such as in this case, or fairly localized, it tends to occur a couple of centimeters above the insertion. And it's pretty easy clinically to differentiate the mid substance uh, proper from the rest. Now, importantly, as I mentioned earlier, it's a tendinosis. It's degeneration without inflammation. Actually, it's strictly not even that. It's a failed healing response. And it's the one of the theories behind it is the continual um, trigger of that failure of healing response is, is one of the, the problems. 
paratendinopathy. Now, this is the, the um, encompassing thin fibrovascular um, uh, sheath that has become inflamed, and it takes two forms. In the acute form, where there's, um, there's a lot of swelling and you can get crepitation, or a more chronic form where things become quite scarred and stuck down and thick. Um, and so you, you've got those two, two different types, and these are more around the um, Achilles at the mid portion, uh, often circumferential. And then we move on to the insertional form of the uh, Achilles, uh, right there, where it inserts onto the calcaneus. Um, you can get bone spurs that form, you can get ossification in the tendon, um, you, sorry, calcification in the tendon, ossification at the uh, enthesis. Um, and again, you get pain, stiffness and firm swelling. And it's quite distinct when you clinically examine somebody to see um, in terms of location that this is an insertional case, whereas the other one was a more of a mid substance. You can also get micro tears right at the junction that often reported on scans. So retrocalcaneal bursitis, well, this is this bursa that sits just in front of the Achilles between this and the posterior superior prominence, um, uh, essentially to lubricate, lubricate things. Um, and always have a look, get your plain x-ray. Not every um, calcaneal prominence has an issue, but if you've got an issue, it's worth knowing whether you've got that prominence. Again, the, um, this uh, bursa is inflamed and there's synovial infoldings um, and you usually have fluid and, uh, and calcification in. Just a word here, um, it could be primarily an inflammatory arthropathy. So it is important, certainly with the insertion ones, to think could this be um, uh, an inflammatory issue and think about the uh, superficial calcaneal bursa there. So what's the problem? Is it the isolated tendon that's the problem? Is it the bony prominence? Is it the bursa? Are these distinct pathologies that just happen to coexist or are they all a continuum of a pathological process? Well, the truth is we don't really know. Um, uh, and, and really what, what we're trying to do is work out which bits are the worst or which bits are the predominant thing that need to be dealt with by our treatment. So diagnosis, well, how do we diagnose these problems? As ever, take a thorough history. Um, classically, there'll often be pain with the first few steps in the morning, or if you've been sitting for a long time at your desk and you get up and about, and then things can loosen up a little bit. The longer you're, you're on your feet, the pain can worsen. Again, screen for inflammatory issues. Also think you may be operating at some point uh, and look at the increased surgical risk uh, factors that could, could occur. On examination, look at their gait. Um, have they got increased forefoot loading? Is there gastronemius tightness? Uh, do a silver skull test. Do they have pes cavus? And then literally locate the tenderness. Is it in the mid substance? Is it at the insertion? Is it at that bursa slightly anteriorly? Is it a combination? Try and ascertain which bit is giving which amount of, uh, uh, which proportion uh, of the symptoms. So get as much as you can out of that, putting the hands on the patient in clinical examination. And the diagnosis is largely uh, clinical. Uh, however, it's not, um, uh, it, it's, it's not, everything. We do need imaging to help because often multiple tissues are involved um, and this can help us find the exact cause of the pain. Oops. Sorry. Uh, can help us find the exact cause of the pain. Um, don't forget the lateral standing x-ray and here we can see this big um, uh, area uh, of calcification in the tendon, ossification at the insertion um, and sort of tells you the diagnosis and then you decide what you want to do. If you need an adjunct or further imaging to help you down the line, you can uh, do that. Ultrasound, very good. It's dynamic, but it's operator dependent. So if you've got fantastic MSK radiologists who can give you great detail, excellent. In the post-COVID world where you're not sure who necessarily may be doing your scan, it may be more useful in certain instances to get the MRI. Um, sometimes you'll need both. So Again, it's not that the MRI is going to uh, be the um, be all and end all. Use them sparingly, but they should be an addition to what you've already learned by examining the patient. Okay, on to management. So how do we get people better? Well, for the mid portion tendinopathy, the treatment, first line treatment of choice um, is stretching. 
okay? It's got most of the evidence and it's eccentric stretching exercises. Um, got a whole host of other, other treatments, shockwave injections, PRP. And it's important to notice that three quarters will settle with conservative measures alone. Surgery is only useful in recalcitrant cases. And this is, this is pretty relatively uh, far more rest than, certainly than the insertion group. So what do you do? Well, theoretically, you could get rid of just the paratenol, or you could take out the degenerative part of the tendon and repair it. But if you take out too much, more than 50%, you've really got to think about augmenting things. So let's just concentrate on stretches for a moment. Really important to explain this to your patients. Get the heel flat, get the knee locked out straight, and get that real gastronemia stretch there. And then move on to the soleus stretch with the knee slightly bent, isolating that real pull in the back of the calf there. Move on to the heel drops, okay? Um, start with dual heel drops. And it's a real key to make the patient understand that the, one of the major con contributory factors is actually in the calves because they've come in with Achilles pain and you're telling them to stretch their calves. And so it, you do really need to explain them. I will often take patients actually around the uh, outside the clinic room onto the, the bottom step and, uh, and just try and get them to feel how, how tight their calves are. And then moving on to the single loaded heel raise with that body weight and really feeling the stretch in that calf there. Uh, and it, people who find it, some people say it's quite difficult to do that. Also lying flat, knee straight, and it's really about highlighting that getting those calves stretched out are important. Okay, enough videos on stretches. So what does the evidence say? Well, um, some uh, number of studies, level one studies, uh, going back to the mid 2000s, mid late 2000s, saying uh, eccentric stretches generally are better than control, better than concentric, um, uh, and with good satisfaction rate. And that's probably why three out of four people are getting better um, uh, with, with them. So. Uh, these two studies by uh, Ron Pedel uh, in the late 2000s certainly uh, had an impact on my practice. Um, there's this idea of uh, shock being, shockwave being as good as the eccentric stretches, uh, but the combination also having a real role to play and possibly being um, a, a better thing. I think the key here is when people come in looking for uh, a magic wand, that doesn't exist. Um, you can give shockwave therapy, but that's not going to get rid of the problem. The ex eccentric stretches are a must. Uh, on top of that, the shockwave can be a very useful adjunct. Um, uh, efficacy of uh, stretches uh, versus PRP. Um, uh, there's been uh, some studies there by DeVos um, and Liu showing not much benefit of PRP and actually uh, more recently by uh, Kenny et al showing um, that uh, there's no significant difference between the PRP and dry uh, needling. Um, I, I hope I don't get um, uh, bashed by all the users in the questions afterwards, but uh, we will see if that generates some discussion. High volume uh, injections, now largely, um, certainly 20 years ago, a lot of injections, a lot of steroid injections were put round by the Achilles. Um, and I, you know, I think practice has moved on from that. Um, there is a feeling of the high volume, almost breezement type injections under ultrasound guidance. Uh, and I recall a very, very um, uh, a clear talk by Otto Chan uh, many years ago, who described uh, putting the high volume stripping um, uh, uh, fluid in, a saline fluid in to strip the paratenon. Uh, and I know some centers use that, but the key here is this at the bottom, is that the post-injection exercise rehab program is essential. So I don't think we can get away from doing the hard work um, to actually get yourself better. So that's the mid-portion tendinopathy. Now let's look at the insertional um, uh, tendinopathy and its, um, uh, its uh, issues. So the effect of eccentric uh, stretching here is more doubtful. Uh, shock therapy uh, is thought to be useful. 
And surgery uh, has a high patient satisfaction rate. And I say that with caution, don't rush in and start operating on every one of these, but where you've tried everything else and things haven't worked, the actual results for surgery uh, are, are reasonably good. Um, in terms of retrocalcaneal bursitis, there is a slightly high complication rate um, if you're doing open uh, bursal uh, excision, but actually the uh, um, minimally invasive approaches uh, arthroscopically or now the MIS burrs have actually got good uh, outcomes. So how do we manage things? Well, a whole host of things are used, heel lifts, non-steroidals, you know, we've got a non-inflammatory condition, but before patients get to see you, they will often have been given an aproxen or other non-steroidals. Uh, activity modification, accommodative footwear. I don't knock any of these because in their own way, um, some of them, because we don't know the true cause of each individual case, they may have some effect. For example, depending on a training pattern, a certain type of training may help, but the truth is we don't strictly know. But when it all fails, um, uh, my, my feeling is when, when, when all else fails, it is just to use the sword. Um, and so operatively, um, we can get good outcomes. But what do we do? Well, we can take out the bursa and the prominence. That's one thing. You could do a dorsal wedge closing osteotomy to close things up and take that calcaneal prominence away from the Achilles and almost detension. De um, or we could do an excision of the uh, prominence, Achilles debridement and reattachment. And I think James Stanley uh, gave a, a, this talk a few years ago in the last round. And he said, when I get to surgery, that he, he actually takes everything and deals with it in one go. Uh, it was a very good talk and, and, and I totally agree with him. Um, so after six months of trying everything else, the principle is you've got to thoroughly debride all the diseased tissue. Your incision, and many have been described, midline, um, lazy, lazy. Well, there, there, people have written a lot on, on actual approaches and incisions. Now, you need to get access to the tendon and all the pathology. And you need to be very wary that the tissue has to be held with great care. So once you do it, you can um, use double row fixation screws, um, uh, suture fixation screws, and people are using a, a lot of those techniques and a number on the market. Uh, if you take more than 50% away, you can use the FHL tendon transfer. Quick word on rehab. One of the reason these sort of uh, double row fixation screws are used is we want the two things that we want after Achilles rupture. After the wound heals, you want early protected mobilization and early protected weight bearing because they, they seem to give better results. So what does it look like inside? Well, this is the crab meat like degenerate tendon tendinopathy with the spur and um, yeah, does not look great. Um, it's just a, a diagrammatic of um, the uh, removal uh, this is a common, uh, um, certainly in the UK, a common uh, technique used now to do an inverted T uh, to uh, elevate um, things off and then essentially use that to um, use, use debride the tendon and use these suture um, anchors to uh, reattach with quite strong things. So in summary, it's a very common problem. It's got a rising incidence. Um, Pinpoint it clinically, okay? Find exactly where it is. Be as anatomical and descriptive as you can. Largely first line conservative treatment, okay? It's very hard, we're all surgeons, but first line is conservative treatment, more so in the um, uh, non-insertional disorders. Think of eccentric stretches and shockwave, get the patients to understand what that means. Um, uh, and re in recalcitrant issues, surgery can work very well. So that's the end of the uh, talk as it is. I'm gonna, I've got three cases uh, to briefly run through uh, and discuss. And uh, Reese, I'm happy to be stopped at any point. So if there's any discussion that comes in or you have any questions that, that we can go in. Um, so the first one is uh, a 47 year old active sporty male, uh, very, very sporty, um, who uh, sustained an acute Achilles rupture um, some seven to eight months prior to him uh, presenting by his physio. Uh, this was treated conservatively, um, but uh, he had ongoing pain. Now, day to day, he returned to getting about, but uh, obviously his demands were much greater than that. Uh, and he had a constant pain and then 
periodically the odd twinge and the fear that it may have gone again and, 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 and that sort of thing. So there was a sort of repeated attendance of physiotherapists uh, and subsequently uh, routed um, uh, to see me. Um, clinically, he had a very thickened uh, Achilles um, with some uh, lengthening, although he had very strong plant affection. This, this gentleman had very, very strong um, calf musculature, but he was wasted on this side. Um, so as I said, functionally he managed day to day, but he really wanted to get back to CrossFit, racquetball, marathons and, uh, and, uh, and hiking. So this was, these were the MRI scans and um, uh, it's got these big streaks and I've purposely tried to show a cross section of some areas where it looks better, um, some areas here where it really doesn't. Um, but clinically he's got thickened, very thickened, intact tendon. So what are the options? Well, you could treat him conservatively, build up your calf muscles, stretches. I think uh, the stretches are, it's not a, it's post-rupture, so it's less, less of an issue here, less of a factor here, but it's really building up the muscle, shocking him, surgically debriding this out and repairing it because it is grossly tendon off, tendinopathic. Um, or doing uh, that and augmentation. Um, and so I had a discussion with him. He was already frustrated. Uh, it was having a significant impact on um, his mental health and uh, he, he really needed and wanted to get back to some form of activity um, more than what he was doing. Um, so I actually debrided uh, the thing and de uh, debrided the Achilles and did uh, FH an FHL uh, tendon transfer. And this is another example of me doing uh, an FHL tendon transfer, harvesting the uh, beef to the heel. And um, uh, Nick Cullen showed some lovely images last week from, from, uh, uh, from the Orthoracle website, which, were, which uh, showed this very well. Uh, and then threading the, um, the, the beefy um, muscle through uh, the calcaneus uh, and fixing it with an interference screw um, before, uh, and this may cause some controversy, before debriding and putting the Achilles back um, uh, on the other side. Now, this is a post-op MRI scan, and before uh, I get quizzed as to why I'm post-op MRIing um, uh, this sort of surgery, um, it, it, the patient returned for another problem sometime down uh, the line uh, for his ankle. And so um, I did have the benefit to get. This. So this, uh, you see, my debridement has created a thinner, um, uh, uh, slightly more homogenous, I'd like to say, um, tendon there, uh, and an FHL uh, with um, uh, an interference uh, screw. So um, so that, that was how I approached uh, and uh, dealt with that. Um, Rich, should I carry on and do the others and then do some discussion at the end? Uh, I could always. Yeah, um, I guess one thing perhaps we could discuss here really is, is whether, because I, I think we're going to probably be seeing a lot more of these. Um, after lockdown, we seem to be seeing a load of Achilles tendon ruptures often ones that have been missed because people haven't had access to, um, you know, to, to medical facilities. Um, and traditionally there, are, you know, apart from FHL, we've got other options such as, you know, VY and that sort of thing for this. What, 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 what makes you go to FHL as a preference rather than to, to think, about, uh, think about that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. I think, I think um, part of it's time. Uh, and part of it's the state of the tendon. Um, and I think in the earlier, um, the sort of two to four to five week period, the VY I think works very well. Uh, and I even, um, uh, the fascial turndown, I think is a very good uh, approach after that to uh, in that sort of four to six, seven weeks uh, can, be, can be very good um, to try and just get the primary uh, bit done. Uh, but I think the important thing to remember is you know, normal tendons don't just rupture. And I think often there's degree of baseline degeneration. And when you've got a tendon like this that is grossly tendinopathic across a big uh, length of it, um, 
with a more sort of degenerate tendon than anything that's looking very good. Um, I think the FHL works very well, and particularly with the function of demands. Um, uh, and again, this is anecdotal. Um, someone, when, when I've done the, the fascial turndowns on, on the more active, um, I have thought afterwards that it's taken them longer to get back to, to where they want to be. So um, uh, my preference, certainly in the sort of very delayed presentation, um, is for, for the FHL tendon. Um, does, does your practice uh, differ from that? Um, no, I mean, I think um, if you, I, th I think the turn down flaps and VY plasties, it, it's, it's a, a much bigger procedure than doing an FHL transfer. Um, often the tendons very very bulky at the end, very difficult to get the wound closed. So I've I've sort of gone away from those almost exclusively now, and you know are essentially doing FHL transfers with with a you know sometimes a, an acute shortening through the area of scar tissue of the of the torn Achilles. Yes, I think that's that's an interesting point because colleagues have said to me, "Well, why are you doing anything to the Achilles if you're doing it? Uh, if you're um, if you're doing a tendon transfer?" And I think that one the feel of it, having the the feel at the back, is um, is quite important, certainly to um, uh, younger patients. And 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 I think um, I think it adds something, and that's totally not based by any scientific background or study. But I think just reattaching, debriding and reattaching the Achilles does add something there. Um, and do you, in, in, in your sports practice, Reese, do you do you do anything particular uh, or is it, is it exactly the same, the FHL tendon transfer? No, uh, it's, it's the same really. I mean, you know, there's, there's obviously some discussion about leaving the Achilles alone and whether you should be doing this arthroscopically, but I, I actually like to open up the, um, the posterior compartment because obviously you've got that beef to the heel, you've got that big muscle bulk. And my, my sort of, I don't know, gut feeling is that maybe that brings a bit of blood supply into your, you know, degenerate Achilles as well. Um, so it sort of makes me feel a bit better, to be honest with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we've got a couple of questions, actually. I think one of them we've, we've probably answered, which is in FHL transfer, what decision making do you employ to decide whether to retain the Achilles or or resect it, and I think we've probably sort of covered that. Hopefully, um, but another question um, is: What level do you do you harvest the FHL? Do you harvest it just at the posterior aspect of the ankle, or do you go for a long harvest and harvest it sort of down in the foot? Yeah, that's a very good question, and um, uh, I, I hope Pete Rosenfeld isn't watching because he taught me to do the two incision approach and, and actually go through the heel, um, and that's how I started off. But um, now I I think with the interference screw devices that are available, um, just under direct vision, um, uh, just literally lifting it up, you can see uh, the tendon um, just nick in there. Uh, and do it under direct vision, take the end, uh, put a, a sort of fiber loop type whip stitch on it. Um, and I think that, that actually uh, it, the morbidity of making a second cut on the uh, medial side of the foot and, and taking a longer tendon and uh, putting it round, uh, my preference is to, is to, is to sort of go with, go with the um, just direct vision approach with the single incision. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Um, there was just a, oh, actually, so, so um, if there aren't any further questions around uh, that, should we move on to, to the next case? Yeah. yeah. So case two is um, a lady in her early 50s who had bilateral heel surgery about 30 years ago um, by um, uh, one of my senior colleagues with, with a very successful result. Um, and she describes it as having uh, both uh, her heel bumps knocked off. Um, she was getting pain at both sides. She had them done simultaneously. She was in Carson, uh, but did, did very well. But over the last few years, the left side has uh, recurred uh, and she's got this problem here with the bump on the left. And these uh, are sort of the best shoes she can get on. And even in them, she gets some rubbing at the back. So she's quite keen to um, uh, get rid of her, her pain. Um, uh, 
and the video does zoom in the moment. She's got a problem going up and down stairs and you can see her spring up on the right, uh, but on the left, real struggle. Uh, and that pain has been there for some time. Uh, she uh, was seen, she was advised to stretch out her calves, she was um, uh, given um, some shock wave, uh, which helped, but it didn't um, eradicate uh, her, her problem. So in terms of um, she, her scar, she's got this scar on the outer side, she's got a fairly prominent bump, um, and she is keen to have something done. Um, again, plain x-ray, you can see how that posterior superior calcaneal prominence with time, where it's been knocked off just there, you can see the contour has come back. But you can also see this big soft tissue swelling, um, and that's the tendinopathy. So again, never underestimate that lateral um, uh, radiograph. It's a very, very valuable thing. Uh, the MRI often adds, particularly if you're thinking about going into surgery, because it can tell you the extent. And sometimes you will be surprised. You, here we haven't got much of a, a bursa, but more proximally you can. And so treatment for uh, this patient was uh, it, essentially with the inverted T type debridement, degeneration, and uh, reattachment. Uh, and this is an example uh, of a post-operative um, uh, thing. And just to illustrate how much you have to take off, so it's really you're getting the saw right the way up or the osteotome to knock off. And you can see just here, these are my interference, suture interference screws um, that reattach and have almost converged here. Um, and again, just remembering why that's done is it's almost to get the quicker after the wounds so the quicker movement and the quicker rehab because that's what better outcomes seem to be associated with with the Achilles so that's just a, a, a very sort of barn door um, uh, uh, insertional Achilles tendinopathy where all three factors can be taken care of in one go the superficial calcaneal bursa the debride the tendon debrided the prominence removed, and then the reattachment. And then lastly... Sorry, it, sorry, Ruth, sorry. Just, just, yeah. um, there's, there's just a question regarding insertional tendinopathy, which might be good to bring up now. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, someone's asked, would you, would you briefly explain the role of eccentric stretching in insertional tendinopathy? Um, yes, doubtful is, uh, is the term I used on some some things above um yeah it's it's some people it, and and this is a it divides uh, the audience and um often with tight calves if you're doing drop downs and you've already got an irritated bursa at the bottom you know there, there is some logic in the fact that that's going to make things worse uh, having very very tight calves that can often be the case, I, I don't think is ever a very good thing for the Achilles. But if we're talking strict, strictly as to what the evidence is saying, it's, it's of doubtful significance. So it's, it's unlikely that it's going to get rid of the problem alone. Uh, I think shockwave uh, has, been, has been more promising there. Uh, and then also just trying to work out which of the three main um, main uh, uh, causative factors it could be. Is it, is it more of a bursal problem? Is it the tendon problem? Because uh, a recalcitrant tendon problem that's not settling with shock, uh, I think eventually you will end up um, having to, having to operate, it, uh, operate on it. And when you do, I think the outcomes uh, are quite good. Great, thanks. And that, that okay. previous lady, she, she already had, I think, a, was it a lateral incision? She, she had a, a lateral zoom. This isn't her post-op, just to No, 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 no. I mean, uh, another patient. If you're doing um, your- Yes, so where do, you, where do you approach it? And, and, and that's a difficult one because the, you know, some people will believe you could just go straight down the middle and ignore it, it's 30 years. I wouldn't. I would probably extend this incision uh, and bring it up um, uh, because I still think you can access it from that side. Um, and so I would probably use the same, same incision. Um, but uh, and hopefully not have to call a, a plastic surgery colleague. <laughs> would you do? Would you do any different? Would you go dead dead center? Um, so so if in in this case where she'd previously had an incision, um, I would probably use that same incision and sort of do an inverted J. 
I, t yeah. I tend to um, I tend for these. I tend to make a a, a medial incision yes. in, yeah. if they haven't had previous incisions before, um, and strip things off medially rather than opening the the sort of the curtains, if you like. Um, yeah. uh, just okay. something I've. I've sort of um, got used to a bit over the last um, over the last couple of years, really. But it's all it's always a you know it, it's always a sort of a, something to consider, isn't it? If they've had an incision previously, as to whether you know you're going to do something, and then all of a sudden you're, you're not going to have any skin after a, a couple of weeks, and um, it, uh, the, and, the wound's going to break down. Yeah, totally agree. And I think it's very difficult. My favourite incision would almost be subtly to the medial side, you know. It, it's far from ideal but this was obviously a procedure to to knock it off the idea of having two so close together uh, I think would make me a lot more nervous um uh, but then that sort of yeah so it's I think it's a difficult call either way really but uh, um and 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 that's a that's a very important pre-operative discussion with the patient um just moving on to uh, the last case so this is um uh somebody um fairly young keen runner um six month history of left uh, achilles pain in the mid substance is fairly diffuse um during gait increased forefoot loading tight calves um, and not the classic bulb but a, a diffusely thickened achilles on the left uh compared to uh the right um, he can manage a single heel raise, although not as comfortably on the right, which is just a spring up. And I'd say it's about 50% bigger uh, on the left uh, with this sort of six month uh, history. Um, and just some, some images to show uh, that, that that side is it's diffuse and it's a long rather than this sometimes bulb that you get in the middle um, uh, of that. And so imaging uh, here, um, uh, I got an MRI scan that shows this sort of streaky uh, mid-substance uh, tendinopathy. He's got very tight calves um, and also that tendinopathy taken uh, at around the ankle joint level. Uh, and yet further down, the insertion is, is fairly, uh, fairly plumb normal. So just a case of a very common presentation of mid-substance Achilles tendinopathy proper. Um, and the treatment there is uh, eccentric stretching um, and shockwave therapy. Um, and everyone has their different approach to this. Some people put shock and stretch together. I'll always get them stretching for a while first so they take it on board and understand. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, add in the shockwave therapy as and when, and there's no reliance on it as a, as a, magic, as a magic wand. Um, just uh, further reading uh, and references, I uh, used uh, this series of books uh, years ago um, as a fellow to write chapter one and actually um, they're largely put together by the Achilles Tendon Study Group, um, a few written a few years ago um, with all the current evidence at the time and uh, I think probably due to be updated at some point soon, very uh, well laid out with key take home messages. Um, and uh, and yeah, definitely recommend them. They're they're available um, online, um, and uh, and the, the the tendon study group with Eska really uh, brings together most of the big names in the um, in this uh, in this sort of pathology and problem. Uh, and just a thanks to uh, our clinical photography department at uh, the Lister Hospital for their help with images, and of course the patients for um, uh, letting us use them. Uh, we mentioned aging. I'm going to be a little bit um, uh, cheeky and put a photo of my dad. This is my dad. He's Britain's oldest Masters athlete. Uh, he turned uh, 95 last summer. Um, he runs now in the 95 to 100 age group. He started in the 85 to 90, uh, then went into 90 to 95. He runs 60, 100, 200 uh, and 400. He's got numerous uh, medals. Uh, this photo of when he when he turned 90, went to Australia and won uh, the World 400. He set a couple of British records. He's uh, had enough of COVID and he's uh, starting again at Lee Valley next month. So just when we write patients off at being uh, old, uh, well, hopefully we don't write patients off being old. Going to these events is very, very humbling. That's a few years ago. In Madrid, 
uh, doing um, Great Britain proud. So well, well done, Dad. Um, uh, and that's uh, that's we really done. So if we have any questions, we can we can discuss them. That's fantastic and fan, you know fantastic achievement by, by your dad. That's 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 brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Um, so what what I was going to ask was you know you usually get a patient come through the door and you know that so they've got they've got signs and and symptoms of of you know non insertion or mid substance Achilles tendinopathy and you say to them, well, you know, what about stretching? Oh, I've done that, I've done that, done that, I've seen the physios. What, 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 do you, what do you then say to them? So, so um, I, I actually examine them and it, absolutely right. Virtually every patient um, has seen a physio, done the stretches, nothing's worked, I need this sorted. And, and, and actually I stand them up and I almost get, get them to stand against the wall, um, in front of the wall, sorry, with the heels flat, knees locked back, not bending the pelvis. And the, the words I use are, let's do a press up. You're just bending at the elbows against the wall. And I make sure they don't bend the knees and I make sure they don't bend the pelvis. And I get them to go down and then I press their calves and invariably they, they, um, they feel it. And, uh, and they said, oh, wow, and that really hurt. And I said, right that's the tightness in the calves and until we get the tightness in the calves taken out that that you're you know the, the, this isn't going to get better really and so just that realization that they've walked in with the problem with the achilles but they actually realize once you show them how tight the calves are they get to take it on board uh, then what I do is I tend to give them an Alfredson type stretching sheet and I explain to them you've got to do it numerous times a day so my my dogma is um you've got to do 10 times on each side for 10 seconds ago um 10 times a day I, I tell them you're not going to do it 10 times a day but if you get it to three or four times a day like you would take a tablet three or four times a day you will see improvements very very quickly uh, and i think that's the key really just getting that on board that actually it's not the once a week you go to see someone and the one you know that time that you have with them it's doing the stretches alone every day and i always tell them you're going to get yourself better uh, and i tell them the evidence supports that three out of four people will get themselves better by doing um, regular stretches uh, one thing i do do is if i send them to physio i ask them to do some manual gastrocnemius release i.e get them on their stomach and someone to work out the calves. And a session of that deep soft tissue massage makes a realization that they've got tight calves. So I think those in combination is, is sort of my approach to how we get them better. So thanks. I mean, just for any junior, so Alfredson was the, was the guy who sort of really revolutionized and explained eccentric stretching. Um, and his paper's um, very good and it is, multiple stretches sort of several times a day to the point of pain and he he sort of advises you know people putting rucksacks on and loading them up with weights as it as the exercises become less and less painful um do you, do you think there's a role for after prolonged time or uh, for um gastroc release surgical in these cases um, I, I i do i do i think there's um there are some people who genuine genuinely try um often pez cabus who just can get it stretched so far um uh, and i'm a big advocate of getting the gastrox um uh, probably been indoctrinated by a lot of talks by um, um matt Solon over the years but i think it is so important that getting that stretch out is is vital um uh, and i think there is a role for it um, in certainly in plantar fasciopathy, but also Achilles tendinopathy. Uh, and so for me, it tends to be, um, it's not a default. It's not that I've seen them at one clinic and they've come back two months later and they've still got tight calves, let's release it. Um, I actually feel that the patient really has to have tried. Uh, and if we're not getting anywhere, that, that it, could be, it could be an adjunct. Right. Um, so... Uh, um, another question. Let's finish off with a couple of questions because time is is against us. Um, what do you feel is the role for for PRP? 
Um, I have to be very open. I, I have uh, very little experience with PRP. Um, I do remember um, uh, traveling out to the, to the US and New York and seeing it being used fairly regularly. Um, I think that Kearney um, uh, review in uh, 2021 um, has not shown it in the best light. Um, uh, however, I'm very wary of dismissing things because uh, in medicine, we have a, a cyclical thing where um, it may not be vogue at the moment, but in a few years, the if the right studies are done in the right way and the right amounts are used, and there's so much we don't know. So uh, I think it could have a, a role. Um, it doesn't have a, a regular role in my practice. and, and, and uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't be the best person to answer that. So um, I don't think at present it's uh, massively backed by evidence. Fine. And an another question, um, what percentage of success do you quote to the patient post-surgery for insertional and non-insertional tendinopathy? Um, so I would, yeah, again, um, around, and I'm a bit wary of uh, quoting percents because um, if you put a if you put a percent out there, even ninety nine, you've got the the one percent who doesn't. I would say around 80, 85 percent, and I, I would tell them it would take a good um, year to recover from it. If I'm honest, there there will be sort of uh, um, uh, fair by about three months, um, better by about six, but a year to fully recover from it. And and I think the pre op counselling is is vital. This is not. Uh, hip replacement, knee replacement surgery, where patients come out, walk, uh, and everything else, you've got a host of potential problems. Um, patient has to be on board. There's a lot of hard work involved from uh, the minute you've done the surgery, keeping the foot elevated above the level of the heart for 45 minutes of every hour for two weeks to get the swelling down. Uh, and I take a long time to, to, to get that through to patients. Your heart is here and your foot is down there. And the only way is to use gravity to get that down, to get your wound to heal. Uh, and thereafter, it's not a case of just walking on it. We can talk about early accelerated rehab, which is what we like to do, but going through uh, what you have to do after the surgery uh, takes a while. Uh, and some patients, when they hear that, will turn around and say, you know what, I'm go for another round of shockwave therapy first or you know what I really don't want that so um so to answer the question I would say uh, around 80 uh, to 85 percent with a, a big caveat that there are a number of potential uh, complications that occur, can occur um uh, at, the, at the bottom of it so and again that's not based on any hard evidence I can quote to you at this at this moment great well I think we're we're coming up to nine o'clock. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Um, thank you, Root, for a real tour de force there around a, what, what is actually a very big subject for, a, for an, hour's, uh, an hour's lecture. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Ramsey Health again for, for sponsoring the evening. Um, just a, a final reminder, um, attendance certificates for your CPD will be issued if you and when you submit your feedback. Um, as I said before, if you, if you haven't um, received an automated email um, in the next 24 hours, then use any previous link and enter the new code shown in the Zoom chat, um, which should be available. Um, but if not, then let us know and uh, we can address that. But usually once you've submitted your feedback, you will get your um, attendance certificates. So. Um, thanks everyone for um, for staying with us and attending what was what was a, re a really excellent hour um, and hopefully we'll see you soon in the next lectures of distinction. Thank you. of Ramsey here in the UK. Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. We operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff, and incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. 
Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey Hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide, and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic programme called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this programme and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this programme out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare. The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people.